boy, that has not worked in a long time. <laughs> I want to welcome all of you to a really special event here at Rice and to thank all of you for taking the time to be here. Today's talk is co-sponsored by the President's Office as part of the President's Lecture Series and also by the Task Force on Slavery, Segregation, and Racial Injustice, co-chaired by Professors Byrd and McDaniel. Many of the members of the task force are here today. And this is pursuant to their charge to sponsor public presentations and dialogue, in particular around Rice's history relating to race, but of course much more broadly about some of the issues we must confront as a nation. Ruth Simmons is, to put it simply, one of the most extraordinary leaders of higher education today. She grew up in Houston, earned her BA at Dillard University in New Orleans, and her master's and doctoral degrees in romance literature from Harvard. She began a steady path of leadership positions at a variety of universities after, of course, the, the usual career as an assistant professor moving through academic positions and establishing herself as a scholar. But she began this uh, leadership positions at various universities beginning in 1978 as provost of Spelman College, then vice provost of Princeton, then president of Smith College, College and then president of Brown University for 11 years. After serving as interim president of Prairie View University, I'm sorry, Prairie View A&M University, they asked her to stay on and become its permanent not forever, but for <laughs> I don't think anybody would take these jobs if they were forever. But uh, after they had some brief exposure to Ruth, they of course wanted her to stay on, where she continues to serve today as their president. And importantly for us at Rice, President Simmons served for four years as a Rice University trustee. I would say that no one today brings the breadth of perspective on higher education that President Simmons does. At Brown, President Simmons established the University Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice to examine Brown's historical connection to slavery and to make recommendations in light of that history. Today, President Simmons will speak on from legacies of injustice to healing actions the way forward. After her remarks, she will take questions from the audience. Please join me in welcoming President Ruth Simmons. I hope that was for that. Thank you. Thank you. I think I managed to turn my microphone on. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, <clears throat> I want to begin uh, certainly by giving my thanks to the committee for the invitation to speak with you today. Thank you, David, for um, hosting um, this event. Um, I, I can hardly see you. Um, <laughs> Um, I think the earnest effort to address serious questions always merits participation, and so I am pleased to be here to play a small role in the process of discovering the way forward. You know, when one does these things, um, there are often surprises. And I have to say that I'm a little bit discombobulated by the fact that someone who's very important to me as a child, a mentor from my high school days, is actually in the audience today. <laughs> Letitia Plummer, 90, <laughs> what? <laughs> 90, 95 years old, 97. 
what a blessing she was to all of us young people uh, who encountered her in Fifth Ward. And you know, people can hardly believe this today because um, ideas are so set about what's good and bad, what's valuable and not valuable. It's still hard for people to understand that you could grow up in a shack on Sumter Street and Fifth Ward, encounter the most magnificent teachers and mentors, and end up president of an Ivy League university. That is not something that should surprise us. That should be something that we think of as, yes, of course. Um, if we're doing all the right things in this country, giving opportunity, providing it, uh, an education that merits what children should have, should be no surprise what they're able to achieve. Mrs. Plummer, thank you so much for everything that you did for me and so, so very many others. Thank you. Um, <laughs> almost 20 years ago now, while I was president of Brown, we had a simple idea, truly a simple idea. Why not unearth the facts surrounding the involvement of our founders in the transatlantic slave trade. Such a simple idea. We wanted to know what the story was about our founding. What happened? Um, was it true that our incorporators struggling to raise this Baptist university, the first Baptist university in the country, and it was being created, of course, because, you know, the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians had already done their thing uh, with the other Ivy League universities, and the Baptists were seized of the, um, uh, of the competitive idea that they needed their own university, too. And so they brought a minister up from Pennsylvania uh, to lead them in this endeavor. This minister from Pennsylvania happened to be a slaveholder. He brought at least one slave with him to the task. And then he found people of like mind in Rhode Island to help him with this venture. And most of them were involved intimately in the slave trade. And so it caused people to ask, well, was Brown founded with slave money? So we needed to find out. We immediately discovered that while the research work was eminently doable and worthy, immediate recriminations arose as to our motives in undertaking such a study process at such a distance from our founding. And not only that, but this most illegitimate of individuals was responsible for it, a black woman with obvious, obvious spurious motives was trying to set up a process to secure reparations. That was the narrative when we started. During the celebration of Brown's um, 250th anniversary, uh, we opened the University Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. And at that moment, um, with the report and the study well behind us, I spoke of the reasons for this undertaking, this, this undertaking to find out more about our history. The creation of the center was actually the result of the enactment of a set of recommendations presented to me by the Slavery Study Group commissioned to research the topic. The recommendation of the center was one of many made by the committee and it was one of the more important, I think, and challenging to implement. On that historic occasion of the 250th anniversary, I thought it important to speak about the challenge we faced in confronting the truth about the deep ties of Brown's founders to the slave trade. There's something about that occasion, uh, after all, 250 years, celebrating the history of the university, 
it would have been easy to celebrate that history with no mention of slavery. But I thought it important to talk about the center in the context of now this 250 year history. I was hopeful about the creation of the center because I thought it had the potential not only to influence policy on the contemporary issue of human trafficking, but also to represent how our university in carrying out consistently honest and rigorous scholarship can produce work that is important, edifying, uplifting, and socially relevant for the time. Focusing on the issues of human exploitation and the quest for equality of treatment among human beings, the center would not only continue to unearth long hidden information about historic slavery, but would also carry out research on modern forms of slavery. Given the current evidence on human trafficking, which worldwide, as you know, is more extensive than the transatlantic slave trade at its peak. It is surprising that there is not greater attention in the academy to the problem of human trafficking. As the history of chattel slavery in this country showed, there were many passionate perspectives on whether the traffic in humans was actually morally wrong. This should not surprise us, I think. I find it immensely helpful to try to contextualize uh, that time by thinking about where we are in this moment, about the things that we disagree about. Now, some of us would say there are fundamental principles of human decency. And yet others would counter that some human beings do not deserve decency by virtue of their origin, by virtue of their resources, by virtue of any number of different distinguishing characteristics. So in our time, we disagree. And so it's easy to understand how during a period of the enslavement of human beings, people could disagree about whether or not it was right or wrong. In confronting both historic and present acts of discrimination, exploitation, genocide, and other crimes against humanity, there are always apologists and deniers who hold sway for a time in rejecting the very existence of such wrongs. When times inevitably bring greater light on such questions, the magnitude of these crimes is more vividly exposed by the unwillingness of many, so many, to lift the veil on the long-term effects and legacy of such acts. You who are historians and who know the history of how the country divided, came back together, so to speak, after the Civil War, know how important it was to have almost an official policy of forgetting. Strategy used by many in this country after the Civil War was to force people to forget, to forget the origins of the war, to forget the heinous acts that transpired causing people to want to go to war. And that was in many ways largely successful, that forgetting, so much so that there are all kinds of places in this country that today have no memory, public or otherwise, of their slave history. Soon after we started our work at Brown, um, the New York Historical Society mounted an exhibition on slavery in New York. 
it caused an uproar because New Yorkers had, of course, completely erased the fact that there was slavery in New York. And, you know, it's always useful, especially in the North, and the Northeast is the most uh, ardent purveyor of this, to feel superior to the South. This is, this is um, for many, um, really, uh, a kind of raison d'etre. And so uh, the idea that the slavery in New York would be exposed was, of course, offensive to them. Um, there are such compelling reasons to confront the legacies of these kinds of crimes. The delay in coming to terms with inhumane past practices not only forestalls the necessary societal healing required, but potentially creates among victims the impression of a willing, ongoing complicity with such actions. Every day in this country, that people refuse to draw links between the current status of some African American communities and the legacy of slavery, I can tell you that African Americans are very much convinced of this complicity. The resentment created by this silence and inaction with regard to acknowledging fully a perceived wrong adds further to the challenge of understanding, reconciling oneself to, and moving beyond such wrongs. So our efforts at Brown attempted to tackle a two-century-old question that clung like ivy to the walls of the university. To confront the facts unflinchingly and to present what we learned to the world was our goal. However, we knew that we had to do more than present the facts and say, so what? So what? A mild shrug in response to grievous wrongs is clearly an insufficient response and an affront to the gravity of immense wrongdoing. We chose to mark the moment of coming to terms with the past in the most transparent way possible. Proceeding in this way, didn't require unanimity of perspective. Not at all. This is the thing that's so wonderful for us to learn. We don't need to agree. We can have division as long as we don't have shame and blindness to the facts. This process allowed us to move beyond recrimination to action and resolution. And I should say that many people were terrified of taking this on at Brown, the eponymous university, where the infamous John Brown, an infamous slave trader, gave his wealth and where his descendants are still very much involved in the university. So the family is still there, and we are undertaking an effort to investigate what they did and how they did it and how the university might have benefited from that. And we had to do that and maintain a relationship with the family. It is possible. As far as I know, there is no way yet discovered to implant surgically in every human being the discernment needed to understand and empathize with a wide variety of human conditions. Would that that were so. Such empathy is acquired through education, through openness to understanding difference, and sometimes by experiencing firsthand offenses that, while less severe, enable us by sleight of mind to understand the kind of reaction a reasonable human being would have to such extreme treatment. There are so many people who cannot understand the anger 
who cannot understand the alienation, who cannot understand the grief that endures for so many generations in the face of massive human crimes. And so many cannot understand it. Why can't you move on? Why can't you get over it? Why do you have to have a chip on your shoulder? That happened way back then. This is now. I had nothing to do with that. Don't blame me. To deal with divergent moral behavior and corrupt ways that have led to or could lead to grossly inhuman apps. We are left to our education and the social structures on which we rely to help us develop that ability to build bonds across differences. Organized religion, on whose tenets we often rely for this purpose, offers some help, but we know that different religious tenets often incite the kinds of bias and conflict that ultimately leads to crimes against humanity. But still, the motivating rationale for most religions is to eliminate evil doing and to uphold that which is godly and good. So there has to be some value for many in establishing those standards, whether we follow them or not. But in the highest and best sense, universities, I think, may be the best at project protecting society from inflicting organized grievous injury. The future of the human species is too important for individuals and communities to be left to muddle through this stage of evolution unenlightened about the causes and consequences of their actions. At their very best, universities study every aspect of the reality that we live. We stress the interconnections among fields with good reason, only a richly diverse understanding of the world can help us utilize the full benefits of the advantages that evolution has thankfully bequeathed to us. That is, not only the learned insights that have already saved us from extinction, but also our ability to avoid dangers and wrongdoing in the future by studying carefully the lessons of the past. One such danger that we need to become better at perceiving and managing is the lack of empathy for the other. We have too little inborn propensity for empathizing with the fate of some of our fellow humans. It is to our education we look to provide a bulwark against harmfully misunderstanding and exploiting others. So far, education is not doing an adequate job of protecting the world from those who choose massive exploitation as an appropriate way of life. I think universities can accelerate the work of humanizing their communities, their students, through a more conscious program of educating for justice, both on and beyond the campus setting. I believe the reluctance to date to embrace this broader role is due to an obvious and understandable dilemma. If a university is to further its role as a neutral site for discourse, teaching and learning and discovery, will that role be compromised if the formal challenge of the illicit and inhumane is written into its mission? Some believe that universities are best served if they remain apart from such challenges content to research and debate such issues, but nothing more. That approach has served universities reasonably well for the past centuries. However, I believe that universities need not fear engagement with such issues, as long as their official actions are carried out with the greatest integrity and independence, their actions should redound ultimately, both to the long-term benefit of the institution and to the positive advancement of a more humane society. By contrast, I think, universities may jeopardize their perceived importance and the credibility of their value by settling for the least controversial approach to societal issues. One could argue that a university that does not engage 
with challenging issues and their own tainted actions and legacies is breaching a central tenet of its off-sided idealistic educational values, which after all emphasize fidelity to truth and service to society. Veritas, Luke's, all of these vaunted Latin phrases about what we represent as uh, universities. That has to have some meaning. We know all too well that staying on the sidelines during a human crisis is a ready formula for society's contempt. But where does one find the balance? As I've said often, I still believe that the governance of universities, when respected, is the best protection from missteps in this arena. While governance systems have sometimes produced unwise decisions, the many participants in decision-making on campuses make the university an excellent and perhaps the best locus for the debate of human rights issues. The give and take of such debate, if unconstrained and taken seriously by administrations and trustees, can lead to sensible agreement on how to respond to even the most difficult issues. The apartheid struggle offers a good example of how universities came to terms with a divisive human rights issue. To prop up an illegal and exploitative economy by investing in South African companies without a plan and promise for a role in reform would have been untenable. Campuses pressed unwilling administrations and trustees to do the right thing by divesting or adhering to a set of principles for amelioration of legal discrimination against blacks. But few universities would have acted without the wellspring of activism that insisted on some form of action. I can say from experience that university governance is often fraught. Would you agree with that, David? Hundreds of interest groups arise to place pressure on universities to take action on issues of concern to their particular group. The question of what rises to the level of social or moral ill requiring some action on the part of the university is often debatable. In truth, the university must avoid accepting every plea for action on every issue. To go down that path would greatly weaken the ability of universities to influence important social policies. But while it must not endorse every attempt to become involved in a social issue, it should rely on its governance system to test arguments for and against involvement. That process in and of itself accomplishes several goals, I think. First, it ensures that the university does not become the thing of one group, of one individual's agenda. Secondly, it strengthens the learning environment. To debate human rights issues such as massive inequality and exploitation prepares students for lives of full engagement with political and civic issues. Third, it models the type of process that can be used to combat human rights abuses. Fourth, it challenges an institution to stand up to improper pressure from those on the wrong side of a moral issue. Would that the United States Senate had seen my remarks before last week. <laughs> Wouldn't have mattered. Fifth, it forces an institution to look to its own shortcomings in ways that improve upon the treatment of those in the university's community. And finally, it provides singular examples to others of how to deal with difficult issues where in many different perspectives coexist. The proof of the import of such actions can be seen in the work of the Committee on Slavery and Justice at Brown, led by Professor Jim Campbell and Professor Tony Bogues. The creation of the committee was widely misunderstood at the outset, and it was much criticized. But through months of work, including deal with, dealing with differences among committee members themselves, the committee emerged with a sensible proposal 
to address what they defined as an historic wrong, and that is many of Brown's founding trustees had participated in and benefited from the transatlantic slave trade. The founding president of Brown, as I said, was himself a slaveholder. The disclosure of the, one of the things that, you know, students often said is, well, oh my goodness, how can, how can we deal with this? And, you know, they come in and say, well, but this is, you know, this is, how are we going to deal with that? And so I would say to them, look at that portrait on the wall. That's the first president of Brown. He was a slaveholder. I'm a descendant of slaves. I sit at his desk every day, and I look into his visage. So you can handle that. So uh, the disclosure, the disclosure of the facts about our founding incited some anger, to be sure, and and a lot of disagreement. Um, although because of the pristine archives housed on our campus, there was absolutely no refuting the history. In the end, the mere pursuit of the facts through a medium of shared consultation resulted in an outcome that grew to be a source of pride for Brown. One did not have to believe that the committee actually got it right. <laughs> the fact of having taken the time to search the record and rewrite the history of the university's founding in a more truthful light was itself an achievement that one had to acknowledge as honorable. The recommendation to establish a center impressed me because it matched well the university's research mission. Given the profile of current day human trafficking, it seemed right to insist that more work needed to be done, not only to continue setting the historical record straight, but also to examine the continuing consequences of centuries of slavery. I've learned that there's only one way forward from a discovery that an institution, a nation, a company has carried out significant injustices in its past. One must come to terms first with the truth of those actions. In most instances, heinous actions are sanitized or minimized as being appropriate, inappropriate to the historical period in order to accommodate the burnishing of the profile of institutions. Unearthing the truth of past actions is a difficult but necessary step in reconciling the community to that history. It never gets reconciled as long as we run away from it, never. And that is why, so far from slavery, we are still grappling with it today in this country because we've never had a process really that enabled us to deal with that and to get beyond it. How many of you have visited the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington? I think that museum comes closest to anything we've seen in this country to give people an opportunity to deal with that history. And I think it was a brilliant uh, idea to provide a space in that museum for people to recover once they go through the museum and live through that history. So if you haven't seen it, I very much encourage you to see it. Another important aspect of moving forward is creating a process that allows stakeholders to participate as observers, as interlocutors, as committee members, as advocates for one or another position. And we emphasize that everybody had a place in the discussion. People were allowed to have stupid ideas. They were allowed and felt free to voice their opposition and their disagreement. That has to be a part of the, and by the way, I, I didn't use the term stupid when they were offering their ideas. I know better than that. 
The very fact of being heard is a critical element to establishing the legitimacy of any process like this. And everybody must be heard, everybody. Most such processes reveal a shameful nub of truth, but the telling of that truth can be done without overt rancor, and ideally with the objectivity necessary to convince skeptics of the validity of the truth telling. Any sense of bias in the telling of that true account will generally lead others to mistrust the account, dismissing it as a sham. And when the account is released, as we did in this volume, which I recommend to you, it's a beautiful volume. Uh, pay for what you, for the lies you've told. I want you to pay for what you've done that separated uh, people from their legitimate legacy. Um, I think that's less important than a debate about what we do now. How do what about rapprochement? How do we deal? How do I talk to you now? Now that we've cleared the air, how do we communicate? How do I listen to you in a different way based on what I've learned? And how can you listen to me based on that? And let's consider what our shared future will be because we have had this interaction and, and, and learn this truth. What can, how can we use that to advantage? Um, whatever response a community develops, it should fit that community. It should never be somebody else's solution. That's very hard for people because we are imitators at heart. We want to go and pick what the best story is and then we want to do it that way. No, it's not the way to do it. Everybody needs to feel that what they built is theirs uniquely. So the debate at the conclusion of the findings about what is indicated is also a path to healing. At Brown, our committee submitted a long list of recommendations. We accepted only a few. Those few were explained in the context of Brown today and were implemented swiftly, not through a deus ex machina approach, but through the governance system itself. So we took the recommendations and we sent them through the governance committees and we let them decide. So one recommendation was that we needed a monument to that period on our campus. And so I asked the public art committee to make a decision about whether or not that was indicated. And if they thought it was indicated, where should it sit? And who should be commissioned to do it? And they did all of that work as a governance, uh, a governing uh, body for public art. Today, on the front lawn of the university sits this amazing sculpture it's impossible to miss it. If the recommendation had come to me, I would never have approved it. No, I mean, that, that's the, the truth of it is we all have our own ideas, right, um, about how things should be done. But one of the things about governance is we have to trust the process enough to let the legitimate bodies reach decisions about these kinds of matters. And so that body um, reached that decision and, um, and the sculpture is there. Um, so the committee finished its work and turned it to the Board of Trustees and 
other governing bodies. Um, uh, and those bodies debated further what should be done. So I think overall, this process worked well for our community. The conversation and exploration of the history continues even today with new participants. And I expect that over time, the result of this work will continue to evolve in plain view of the university community. I wish you the best with the work that you have undertaken here. I know you'll be successful as long as the debate is earnest and true, as long as the fact finding is genuine, as long as you rely on the treasured uh, expertise uh, of universities and the, and the wonderful processes uh, used in the university, you'll be fine. Thank you for your attention. I'll take your questions. Do you have this? You have that? Yes. Thank you for your words. Thank you very much. So I'm going to tell you a situation that occurred at Rice during the previous administration, not when we had uh, Malcolm Gillis was president, and then I want you to comment on it, okay? So ch um, Charles Murray was invited to speak on the bell curve, okay? And Malcolm had accepted it. And the black community from Houston, the dominant the ministers that came and asked him to cancel it and say this is an insult to the black community. So Malcolm Gillis called together four or five people, I was one of them, asking us if he should do that. And we said, no, you should have the talk because if you can't have talks like this at universities, where should you have them, okay? So we said yes. So he went forward. That's part one is, do you think we did the right two? Part two is, the minority students at Rice were very was appointed president of, of Brown, um, and immediately after I was appointed, and not yet there, a gentleman put an ad in the newspaper saying how lucky African Americans were to have been enslaved. Um, students on the campus um, stole the newspapers so that no one could see the newspapers. Um, and this was uh, obviously a big story nationally um, because the person who did it was a well-known provocateur. No, let me, let me pronounce that the French way. Provocateur. Um, and so, uh, so before I became president, I'm called and asked, what do you want to do? Well, I'm not even president yet. Let the president who's there decide, right? <laughs> but oh no, here's this black woman. Let's, let's let her decide. Okay, so um, I thought it was unfortunate that the newspaper accepted an advertisement that was so um, uh, hateful, um, and, um, and uh, disgusting. But, and so you're not entitled to advertise your hatred in any venue you want. You can go into the public square and do it, but in a publication, they have a right to refuse your ad and doggone it, the campus newspaper should have refused that ad, but they didn't. So I eventually get to, uh, to Brown, and then the, I think it was the Republicans, wanted to invite him to campus to speak. 
So naturally, the students came to me and said, of course, you can't allow this. But of course, I said, we must allow it. Um, how could you do that? You should understand. You should understand. Uh, how could you betray us like that by allowing this horrible man to come and to spew this racist nonsense on a platform at Brown? I said, well, the reason is very simple. I said, because there is no one at Brown who is more revolted by this than I am. I'm entitled to be as angry as you are. But if I can go and sit and listen to him, and I promise you I will, you can darn well do that too. But here's the beauty of it. Just because people say those things doesn't mean that you have to accept them. So the beauty of it is you get to go and counter his arguments. That's what you're in a university for, to learn to do that. So when you learn to answer him, that's when you will never be afraid again. Because you don't have to hide and not hear things that are unpleasant anymore. You can hear everything and know that you have the courage and the fortitude and the language to answer him back. And that's what we want our students to be able to do. So in terms of uh, did you make the right decision in having him come? I would say yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Dr. Simmons, I'm wondering what the programs um, that are ongoing uh, at, the, at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice are like. Um, it, they are ongoing and they are evolving. I had a call with them today and it turns out um, that one of the newer programs is that they are sponsoring students from the Providence uh, schools to, lo to, learn, to learn about um, civil rights and about African American history. And so they are sponsoring students to come and to take courses and then they take them down south um, to go to museums and so forth, so that's, that's one. They have a visiting fellowship program. Uh, they have a uh, program where they mount exhibitions still. Um, they are uh, involved in an enormous range of activities because um, the center is actually the go-to place around the world when you decide that you wanna deal with retrospective justice. And so um, they said that they had just come back from Glasgow, um, which is now undertaking this process. Um, the University of Cambridge. Um, I myself um, participated in a discussion at, at Oxford uh, on this uh, issue. Look, I thought uh, when I first became president, I was kind of puzzled um, that uh, they selected me as president because I thought, you know, they clearly didn't know who I was when they did that. Uh, and so I, and I did go back to them and say, well, I think you've made a mistake. I don't think you know who I am, because if you know who I am, you would not want me to be your president. So that was, a, that was sort of my, my thinking about it. But in their naivete, they said, oh, no, no, we know, we know who you are. So, and what did I do the first thing I got there? I started this mess with, uh, with uh, slavery and justice. So, but here's, here's what we never know as leaders. You cannot define what others see in you. You can't do that. I saw one thing. It's a what? It's a proud legacy. It's a proud legacy, I understand that, but I've done so much more. <laughs> so, uh, but 
I can only, but I can only, I can only say that um, as a leader, it's important to be responsive to the needs of the time. We don't get to shape the circumstances always of our leadership, although many people try. Um, and so when I came back to Houston, uh, I was kind of exhausted and I retired, of course. And David, retirement is wonderful, by the way. <laughs> Trust me, you're gonna, you're gonna love it. Okay. But here Prairie View shows up uh, on my doorstep and they say there's a need. Well, I don't know anything about Prairie View. So I'm puzzled. I mean, why would you even come to me? Because I'm not the right person for you. But then I thought, Mrs. Plummer, about the girl that I was in Fifth Ward, nurtured by people with no other purpose but to help poor black kids like me. And of course, I then thought how utterly unredeemed I would be if I refused to do it. So life does that for you. Things are presented to you. And the question of whether or not it is right to do or helpful to do is something that you have to wrestle with. And when this arose, I just didn't understand enough how, what the import would be. I thought it was pretty simple. Because the reason, why am I in university life? I'm in university life because going, all, going from Fifth Ward uh, to Dillard um, and on to, to Harvard, I just thought, I didn't see any place where an African-American person like me would have a chance. My father was a janitor, my mother was a maid. I saw that, those as options for me. When I got to university and I saw what a rich world it is where you can think and you can learn and grow, I just said, well, this is the only place for me, because I actually thought that the one unique thing that happens in universities, because I grew up with lies, and you all know that that's the way our community was in those days. Everything was a lie. Ruth, you're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You won't ever be able to do anything really uh, significant, but you could do these things and so forth. I grew up completely with lies and I thought universities don't lie. So where did I end up? I ended up staying in university life because I believed in what the universities represent. So the one thing I was determined to do in my career is to fight for that version of a university. Whatever other versions may exist, that's the one I'm holding to, that's the one I'm fighting for. So with all of your leadership and all of your accolades, can you think of a time where there was something that kept you up at night? Maybe you questioned a certain decision that you made? Ooh. Oh, thanks. I question why I left retirement. <laughs> Um, okay, here's, here's what I tell my students, and uh, I was very fortunate to have parents who were very um, strict. They had to be, because they were saving our lives. I am the youngest of 12. All of us lived to adulthood, and that wasn't so true for all the families that we knew. 
But the way that they did that was by teaching us relentlessly about how to be a human being. And so my mother, um, I remember, um, the great gift was to be around my mother a lot when she was doing chores because, you know, you could sit at her knee when she was shelling peas. Do you know what that is, shelling peas? <laughs> Have you ever shelled peas? You don't know what it is. <laughs> so, <laughs> so shelling peas, and she, as she was doing her chores, she would just be telling us, don't ever think that you're better than another human being, ever. Be kind. Be respectful of other people. Okay. Now, think of, think of parents teaching you that, and at the same time, they're teaching you, if you are in town and you encounter a white person, you step off the sidewalk. Okay? So the balance that they had to do in order to incorporate all of that. So my mother's gift to me was a certain certitude about who I was. Um, and with that came, do your very best. But once you've done that, don't worry about it. And so that's the way I pretty much have done my career. I, 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 I have never looked back. I thought I was doomed, David. When I was coming along, people pretty much hated me. Um, and so when I was at Princeton, honestly, uh, when I was at Princeton, um, come. So, so, so you're there. So I notice that when I would walk across campus, they would go to the other side of the street. I was such a pariah. You have no idea. So, so it was it was a great shock to me that people thought my work was good because I thought everybody hated me. And I therefore thought I would never ha rise to any position of serious responsibility because I thought I was too outspoken, I was too true to who I was. I mean, I did some pretty outrageous things. I remember uh, going to the president of Princeton and saying <laughs> to the president of Princeton, um, I need to leave work every day at 2 p.m. to pick up my daughter from school. If you have any meetings at 2 o'clock, I want you to know I will never be at them. <laughs> really. I mean, listen, as president, if somebody came and told me that, they'd be gone. Right? I don't know. I just, I, I to me, because of what my mother taught me, she taught me first to be who I am and not to compromise with that. And that has helped enormously because I, have, I don't have sleepless nights. And my worst days, I have not ever encountered that. So I always say to my students, build yourself. Build your sense of self. Know who you are. Know what guides you. Um, and if you do that, you'll always know what to do and you won't be worried about the pe fact that people are crossing to the other side of the street. When, when you pass, <laughs> so, so, yeah. Any more questions? David, I've had to work very hard today. Um, <laughs> Anything you want. Anything. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Make them buy you ice cream. <laughs> Okay, so the question I have is, is in, as far as addressing inequities, um, there's racial inequities, obviously, but there's also two class equity inequities that exist within ethnicities. And, um, and that is often a source of, of a lot of pain within groups, within communities, as well as that, between communities. What are your recommendations for how to address that? Well, um, it's almost unforgivable for people to be ignorant of those differences. Um, but so many are. And I've seen a number of different things uh, to gr bring greater, greater 
um, clarity about that? In the old days, people were very much afraid to disclose differences. Um, and so it was very hard to address. And so if you were poor, you, you'd never say it. You know, that was the last thing. You wouldn't want anybody to know that you were utterly without resources, right? It was a source of deep pain and embarrassment. Um, today, students on many campuses organize themselves around uh, their various identities, and therefore, it is possible to talk about it and to disclose it uh, to, uh, to uh, community members, and you can actually do something about it. Um, I remember uh, I was lucky enough to get a um, $130 million gift um, when I was at Brown, and um, it was a very strange um, uh, thing that happened because I was having lunch and at home one day, and I, the phone rang, and it was this gentleman, and he said, Ruth, uh, what's the largest gift you've gotten? Uh, and I told him. He said, well, I want to be the largest gift. I said, that, that's okay. Well, I can make that happen. <laughs> uh, and he said, but what would you use it for? And so I said, for the desperately poor students who have to come to Brown, who are embarrassed about the fact that they, are, they dwell in the midst of immense wealth, um, and they are so poor. And so what we would do is um, give them scholarships. with parents and students so enthusiastic about being identified with other uh, families um, just like them. So that has been the healthiest thing in the world. So I, I think that's the way, uh, of course, there are communities, our first generation students that gather. The students more and more are organizing themselves around all of these different things. And when they do, we have an opportunity to talk about it because they have self-identified as needing to talk about this. So I think that's very healthy. We very. Have, we have time for one more question. Make it an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, just, I just want to make sure. <laughs> it's going to be up to you whether or not it's easy. So uh, um, I'm, I'm looking at, at uh, five of Booker T's original towns, looking at research for these towns. And I'm challenged with the differences between ideologies of Booker T versus Du Bois or, Book, or yeah. Du Bois versus Garvey. And so the question is, I, I, I heard you talk about the importance of relying on the system or the governance structures that we have. But that kind of diverse maybe you could share a little bit about what you understand with regards to this difference. The difference, Dubois is very much about the system and governance and following those structures to make change, whereas Garvey and, and Booker T are action-oriented uh, guys, were action-oriented, and they wanted to do things to make change. So, okay, you understand that when I say governance, I'm not talking about your U.S. government. Sure, the university. Okay. I'm talking about the university. The university. Okay. And we're talking about the university. Yeah. So can you, can you share with us... Yeah, um, two incredible figures. You have to say that in one of the things produced by the gross um, uh, inequality and unfairness uh, in this country it was incredible leaders. So different, so different from one another. Um, and so you could have existing at the same time and a Malcolm X and a Martin Luther King, right? Uh, and a, a W.B. Du Bois and um, Booker T. Washington. So I don't, I don't like to categorize people um, as one thing or another. 
I think that most of them were pretty uh, deep thinkers. And when we categorize them in the way they often are, Booker T. Washington was an Uncle Tom, for example, it just goes against everything we know about his intelligence uh, and about the way that he, no doubt, came to his conclusions about what he think was the best methodology and approach. So if I were to ask you what you think is the best approach, you might say one thing, but I can tell you that she would, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. But I can, I, can, I can tell you she's not going to agree with you. So what? Okay? We all have our different approaches. What I'm saying is we can, these different approaches can coexist and they can um, uh, enrich our approach uh, fundamentally, right? Um, and so we're too bound by, so, I mean, if, so, so, um, Smiley and uh, Cornell um, took out after Obama because he was not, I don't know, righteous enough, not um, diligent enough on some of these uh, progressive issues uh, and so forth. Um, really? Um, so um, you, can, you can launch those salvos, it's easy to do, but the reality is that we're dealing with enormous complexities. If you think that a history of a thousand years can be reduced to a process that you're going to use that's going to be foolproof, that's not going to happen. So what do we do, what do, we do to muddle through? That's what I worry about all the time. And I will say that the reason I was wrong about um, uh, the way my career would go is that I always thought that my way was just a way. It was not the way. Okay? So I focused on doing what I thought would be sensible and then I worked hard at it. I didn't try to disparage what you're doing, or what somebody else was doing, unless they were wrong. Uh, but, um, and that's all important in a university. This is what I teach my students. Don't come into my office, so my students go, oh, you know, Ruth, I'm sick and tired of people um, asking me about my hair. Uh, I'm just, I just don't want to be bothered with it anymore. You could say that as an individual. What I answer is, that's what you're here for, to answer questions about your hair. And if you're not interested, and in fact, this is the way I welcome new students when they were coming to talk, think about coming to Brown. My speech was, if you don't want other people up in your business, if you don't want to tell people who you are and where you come from and why you are who you are, please don't come to Brown. Because the only way this experiment works is if you come with the understanding that you're here to benefit others just as others are here to benefit you. It took me so long to learn that. It took me so long. I had, a, I had a little bit of an epiphany late in life, and that is, um, I went back, Harvard asked me to come back to give the Phi Beta Kappa lecture. Harvard was lucky to have me and that I gave more to Harvard than they gave to me. So that's what, that's what I want all, I, I want all students to get that. When you come to college, you come prepared 
to share who you are. I would extend that by basically to any human interaction, you know, uh, and that is if I come to know you, I'm here to tell you about me. I'm not just here to absorb what everybody else is putting out. I'm here to put myself out so that you can learn from who I am. That in human relations seems to me the only way to really make it work instead of just taking off the things that we think matter and that people have no right to ask us. Now, there are a lot of questions people ask me and I just don't answer, I don't answer. It's true. But um, there are some things in the realm of, you know, what is useful that I can respond to. So, um, you, so, you know, somebody said to me, I, I just thought this was terrible, but um, I went into the basketball game on Saturday night. We won the basketball game. Um, and, when I, and when I walked in, there's a, um, a booster sitting right there on the basketball uh, uh, floor. And when I walk in, minding my own business, he says, are you ill? I said, no, I'm not ill. He said, well, you look like you've lost weight. Well, I mean, why is he commenting on my weight? You see what I mean? But anyway, but I want you to know, I took it. I took it. I dealt with it. So people do things like that. And we cannot get along in this world if we worry about every insensitive thing that people say to us. I have a regent, a regent, I'll say this and I'll let you go. I have a regent, a regent, you know what a regent is? Yeah. Member of the board, who every time he sees me, he, he's so wonderful and very nice, every time he sees me, he says, hey girl, So in that first moment when he did it, I thought I could give him a dissertation on why black women do not permit people to call them girls. I could do that dissertation. I thought about that. <laughs> but then I thought, this is a really, really nice man who doesn't know what the heck he's doing. And one day, I'm going to take him aside and I'm going to say, please don't say that to black women because it's an offense, right? But I don't have to do that in the moment. Every time it happens to me, I can deal with it. So that's the way I chose to deal with it. Did I do the right thing? I don't know. No, you think I should have challenged him? Okay. Okay, thanks for your advice. <laughs> Uh, one of the co-chairs of the task force. Uh, on behalf of the task force, I want to thank all of you for coming today. As President Lebron mentioned, this is the first of many events of programming that we hope to bring to campus. Uh, and we want to thank President Lebron for supporting uh, our, our lecture. Um, uh, most of all, <clears throat> we want to thank President Simmons so much uh, for spending her time with us today. Uh, she spent time before the lecture as well with the task force offering her insights, and we're so grateful to you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>